Hey there, interwebs. Hands up if you've heard of Cold Iron. Keep them up if you can say definitively what it is. Due to the limitations of the medium, I have no idea what you did, but I'm going to imagine you raised your hand and then put it right back down again. Assuming that's the case, you're probably now wondering what is Cold Iron, really. Well, I can answer that question in several ways, so I will. The simplest answer is probably the most historically accurate due to Occam's razor, and that's that people were just being a bit poetic. I'm a writer, and I'll confess I too suffer from adjective addiction. Cold iron probably just refers to -to run-of-the-mill, er, forge, iron. It's a bit like how we say cold steel, hot lead, and, uh, tepid zinc. This answer is short and simple and therefore not very interesting, so let's keep digging. In folklore and mythology, cold iron is often depicted as being harmful or disruptive to trolls, witches, ghosts, and fair folk in general. Basically, if it's magic or supernatural in some way, you gotta use cold iron. Unfortunately, these tales never explain why cold iron is special, or even if it's in some way different from regular iron. I suspect the answer to the latter part is no, and it's called cold iron because if you touch iron, assuming it's not hot, it feels cold due to its high thermal conductivity. So why should regular iron be considered this special material? For starters, it's relatively difficult to obtain compared to other metals such as bronze and tin due to the high temperatures required to smelt iron ore. Additionally, fair folk are entities who are typically one with nature, and something as unnatural as smelted metal is at odds with their physical being. If that's the case, though, these days they should be much, much, much more worried about things like plastics. The one that springs to mind is polytetrafluoroethylene, better known as Teflon, because polytetrafluoroethylene is kind of a mouthful. Teflon containers are the only thing that can store fluoroantimonic acid, which is arguably the world's strongest acid, and can dissolve iron like it's tissue paper. A modern fey hunter might be well advised to carry a plastic knife and trade their cold iron bullets for Teflon-coated ones. You could probably keep a fairy in a Tupperware container if you poke some holes in the lid. The most that can be said is that cold iron generally seems to be iron that has the quality of being magic or anti-magical in some non-specific way. This answer is also not very fun, so let's look at some other, more specific properties cold iron might possess. I should warn you now that if you want to fall down a very steep Wikipedia hole, look into metallurgy. You've got cold iron and cast iron and puddled iron and pig iron and wrought iron and pot metal and carbon steel and stainless steel and this doesn't even scratch the surface. It was about halfway down this rabbit hole, though, that I discovered some interesting properties of wrought iron. To start with, it has very low carbon content, less than 0.08%. The low end of high carbon steel used to make knives and other tools is ten times that amount, ranging from 0.8 to 2%. Due to its low carbon content, it cannot be hardened through heating and quenching. To learn more about that, check out Chad's excellent video linked below and on screen. Now, if you take a piece of high-carbon steel, especially one which has been hardened through heat treatment, and you bash it with a hammer, you run a high risk of chipping pieces off of it or shattering the whole thing. Wrought iron, on the other hand, is relatively soft and can be hammered into shape without heating. This process is known as cold working. This malleability doesn't last forever, though. The more you work and strain the piece, the harder it becomes through a process called work hardening. If you take a piece of wrought iron and cold work it to form, you'll have a nice hard piece of cold worked wrought iron, or simply cold iron. Wrought iron also has what are known as stringers, which are slag inclusions in the metal, and these are unique to wrought iron. These inclusions can give wrought iron higher corrosion resistance than other kinds of steel. Due to variation in origin and manufacture, this isn't always the case, but it can truthfully be said that most forms of wrought iron are generally more resistant to rusting. Wrought iron can be melted down and cast to form, but the stringers will be lost. If you take a piece of wrought iron, cold work it to the shape of a knife, and hammer an edge onto it, you'll get a blade with the seemingly magical properties of neither rusting nor dulling, despite being made from soft, easily corroded metal. You'd only get this from wrought iron that's been cold worked and not cast into shape. Additionally, if you etch wrought iron, you get a beautiful, almost wood grain like pattern. This doesn't have any special properties, it just looks pretty, but when you're claiming to have magical powers, presentation counts for a lot. So will we ever have a definitive answer to the question, what is cold iron? Probably not. But I think work-hardened wrought iron is the most satisfactory definition given what we have, so that's my headcanon and I'm sticking with it. Well, this is the part of the video where I say if you like the idea of magic and fantasy tropes in a modern setting examined with an analytical eye, you'll probably enjoy my novel Steve Knight, Paranormal Investigator. But I'm not going to say that this time. I'm going to say this instead. If you don't enjoy magic and fantasy tropes in a modern etc., I have no idea why you watched this video, but you might enjoy my comedy book, Have a Nice Day, which has no magical elements whatsoever, and instead focuses on nuclear proliferation from the point of view of two ordinary schmucks who can't do anything about it. It's funny, I swear. Link in the description. Thanks for watching and reading Have a Nice Day.